I, I want to talk about, uh, uh, I guess, in some ways, how we've defined, redefined what public value is in the New Zealand social welfare context. And what I mean by that, and the reason I've used the title Measuring Tomorrow's Outcomes Today, is that we've introduced in the social welfare space, and we're about to ex actually expand it a, a, a lot wider across the, uh, the, the public sector, uh, actuarial modelling, which actually traces uh, lifetime outcomes and the costs associated with those outcomes and then looks at the impact of particular interventions and says did that change the life course rather than just the immediacy and uh, and it's fundamentally shifted um, what it is that we uh, do in, in terms of both the delivery of public services uh, in New Zealand but more importantly how we measure the impact. Um, and I guess for me, uh, the reason I talk about it in public value terms was uh, as an alumni of uh, the Executive Master's Program through ANSOG, um, I've waited five years to be able to use the strategic triangle. Um, and, uh, and so for me, uh, having got there now, it's, uh, it's actually, uh, 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 I guess in some ways, um, transformative for us to be able to actually say we have a new measure of public value. But actually you can't understand that measure unless you actually understand the changes that needed to occur in the organisational capability and also a fundamental shift in the authorising environment. Now you heard from Minister Bennett this morning and you would have seen where some of that impetus came from in the authorising environment. But I want to address all three dimensions so that you get an understanding of what it's meant to be able to actually achieve this. Because this is a four year project, didn't happen overnight. Um, and, uh, and after that period of time, uh, we sort of look back at it now and sort of say, this is the change that we were able to make. But actually, the journey and what we've been able to learn and achieve are, are just as important in terms of understanding the public value proposition here. So this is how it works at an aggregate level. For us, we start at that column at the end and we basically ask one question and then a second one. The first question we ask is, how long is every client in our system going to spend on benefit? And then the second question we ask is, how much will that cost? Okay? And that's where we get the term liability from. All of the clients, the 300,000 clients in the benefit system, and how long are they going to spend on benefit? How much does that cost? And the end number there was $76.5 billion back in 2013. Then what the actuaries do is they say, what impact will the economy have on changing that lifetime cost of our clients, okay? And this has been a really powerful change for us because for a long, long time, attribution uh, in terms of our intervention as an agency with our treasury and being able to say, we invested here, here was the impact we had, and as a consequence of that, we can attribute this amount of change had always been an issue. But the actuaries are able to disaggregate the economic impact. They're able to say, this level of unemployment, this level of inflation, this level of changes in interest rates will equate to this level of impact in terms of changes in number of people on benefit. And so that changes the lifetime cost. The second question that we then ask after we've disaggregated for the economy is, based on our past performance as an organisation, what change would you have expected to see? And that's the 2014 roll forward. So for us, we say, what impact does the economy have? What impact does our past performance have? But then we ask a third question, and this is the fundamental one for us. What additional value do we get as an organisation from differences in investments that we're able to make? And that's the $2.2 billion additional actuarial release that we're able to get. Now let me put that into context. That is 15,000 additional clients that are not on benefit over and above what the economy would have delivered for us and what our past performance would have delivered for us, okay? And when you take those 15,000 and say how long would they spend on benefit and how much would they cost, that's $2.2 billion. So it's where we're able to demonstrate to ministers that we beat the curve. All right? that we're actually able to add additional value to the uh, investments that we're making as an organisation. Then what we do is break it down by the different client types. So we segment that 2.2 billion. And actually that red area that you see in the negative, they're all the sole parents. We put a fundamental investment into sole parents and we were able to measure the impact of that investment um, through that. Uh, in fact, nearly a billion dollars of the 2.2 was just the change that we're able to make um, with particular groups of sole parents. And for us, that was really important because this was a group that only had part-time work obligations and yet we had made a deliberate choice to invest with that group to get them back into work. So of those 15,000, 
nearly 13,000 of those were sole parents that were actually able to assist into work. The key here is transparency though, because the fourth line down you see is our health and disability population. They went backwards. We actually added nearly a year on average to every one of those clients that was on benefit. So for us, not a, not, <laughs> and, and this is the, the part of the system that's been interesting, not only are you able to celebrate the success that you have with client groups, it also highlights for you where the challenges are with other client groups. So for us, it's a learning system that's designed to be dynamic to trace the investments that we make because we did actually disinvest in the health and disability space to invest in the sole parent space. We made the choice to do that because the vast bulk of the children that were at risk in our system were in the sole parent space. So it was a deliberate choice, but it had consequences. The other thing that we've been able to do is the third line from the bottom, which is called recent exits. We were always interested in the issue of sustainability. How long were clients staying in work once we got them into work. And our previous measures of success had just been exits. We never really measured how long they actually stayed. But we had the actuaries actually trace that sustainability question. So recent exits are clients who have left our system, but statistically we know will come back. Okay? We know around 80% of our clients will come back in the next two years. So we wanted to measure to see, are we changing not just the rate of exits that we're getting, but also how long those clients are actually spending in work, uh, and, so, and not in the benefit system. So again, this was a positive result for us because it demonstrated that actually we were increasing the amount of time clients were spending in work and decreasing their dependence on benefit. This, this is the average liability. So the other thing we measure, coming back to that equation that I said before, was how long do clients spend on benefit and how much does that cost? We do that for 17 different segments. And we trace how long that's going to be and then we put the cost into the system. So across the top you see our young parent payments. That in 2013 was close to $250,000. That's nearly 20 years on benefit. And you can see that in 2014, we'd reduced that to just above, it's around 210,000. That was a reduction of nearly three to five years on benefit for us for that group. Now for us, that was extremely powerful because we put a very, very large investment into that space to try and change that trajectory. So for us now, that is a year on year proposition. We see how, how far that curve moves back and, uh, and that's part of the value proposition that we actually have in terms of demonstrating our public value. We also look where it, where it happened. You know, which regions contributed to that overall result? And you can see for us that our large centres, Auckland and Canterbury, are the two dominants. But here's the interesting thing. If we'd used our measures from the past, okay, which was just to count exits, they would be very close. Because of the Canterbury rebuild, nearly two-thirds of what we would have called our job seeker exits were actually in Canterbury, not in Auckland. Auckland chose to focus on sole parents. Now when you see those average liabilities that I had in the previous gas, gra uh, graph, you actually realise that a sole parent in terms of liability is worth twice what a work ready client is worth. So they had a greater impact on the liability because of the types of clients that they actually chose to invest in. Um, a lot of that's to do with the labour market and a lot of that's to actually do with the particular focus that different regions have. Does the labour market actually have the vacancies that suit the particular clients? We go right down to site level. We measure this impact right down to site level. And in fact, to the point where every case manager knows who's on their caseload, how much those clients are worth and therefore the value and the additional time and effort or spend that they might need to put into that client in order to get the, the result that we're after. This was really uh, fascinating for us. This traces the journey of clients through our system. The dark blue lines are those that enter our system as job-seeking clients. The light blue uh, are those that develop mild to moderate mental health. The red are sole parents and the green is supported living payment. Now what you see is that for clients that enter as job seekers, 15 years later, over 30% of them are still on benefit. But the, f the thing that scared us was that you see the vast bulk of them 15 years later, only 2% are still job seekers. The vast bulk are in the light blue, uh, light blue and the green space. They have developed mild to moderate mental health conditions. They have deteriorated in our system. And in fact, what we discovered was we have a two year window with these clients before they seriously start to deteriorate. So we actually started to dive into that because 80% of that growth 
was anxiety and depression uh, amongst clients in our system. So we actually went to psychologists and we said, what drives that behaviour? And it was rejection. Our clients deteriorate in a system that's built on rejection. And in fact, what they said to us was anyone, no matter how resilient you are, if you have seven major uh, rejections in your life, you will develop a condition. And we were sending five clients to one job knowing that four would miss out and we would do it week after week after week and we were perpetrating a system of rejection and it was little wonder that clients in our system were deteriorating. Now the thing for us is it is so much more expensive for us to work with them if they're in the light blue and the green space. So why not be efficient and actually deal with it when it's cheaper and easier and better for the client while they're in the dark blue space? And so it's fundamentally changed our operating model, how we engage with clients uh, and the systems that we put in place to support them so that we can prevent this from happening. And again, this is another graph that we produce every year to make sure the curve's moving in the right direction. This was where we actually measured the result of our, a massive investment that we put into the youth service. And the question we asked was this, our old youth payment used to literally be uh, a cash payment that we distributed to young people uh, when their parents wouldn't support them. And, uh, and so we asked the question of the old independent youth benefit that they received that at 17, where were they at 19? And then we introduced the youth service three years ago. And this was a wraparound support service through contracted service provision with a range of measures that were put in place to support them, budgeting, parenting, and like I said, a very heavy investment from the state. Um, and we asked the question, since the introduction of the youth service, what change has occurred in terms of between 17 and 19? Now, if you were on the old independent youth benefit, over 70% of those clients were going on to a main benefit at 19, all right? With the introduction of a youth service, that has reduced to 50%. That's a 20% reduction in the number of young people on a main benefit at the age of 19. So for us, we were able to do a very, very clear return on investment equation that demonstrated the value of the investment that we were able to make. The critical thing for us was it changed the trajectory of these young people, because there were three things that we knew from the system. A, if they came into our system young, they were the group that were likely to spend a long time on benefit. Age of entry was absolutely critical. The second thing is, if you can change that trajectory when they're young, a range of other adverse things that are likely to happen, such as uh, pregnancy, unwanted pregnancies, and a whole range of those other types of things are less likely to happen. But the second and the most important thing was, we changed the probability of them viewing the welfare system as their default position to actually it being the genuine safety net that it needs to be. Because for a lot of these people, it is a learned helplessness. And they will basically see this as a life choice. And so by changing that, that became quite fundamental for us. This was the, the, the sort of new level of insight that we've got. And this has driven a whole range of change for us. We wanted to know about intergenerational welfare receipt. And, uh, and I guess for us, this was one of those critical questions that we actually had. Does your parent being on a benefit have a significant impact on you being on a benefit and a range of other things that uh, are associated, negative things that are associated with that? So we matched, our data only let us go up to the age of 25, but we matched all of our clients up to the age of 25 and we found a 74% match. Now the scary thing for us was this, 35% or nearly one in three had a parent that was on benefit for over 80% of their teenage years, between five and 18, okay? Four out of those five years, their parent were on benefit. So we dived right into that group. We started matching data with the correction system, the housing system, our child protection system, pretty much anyone that would give us information on it. And the results won't surprise you, but what we found in that space was over 90% of those clients in that space were in a state house. Over 95% of those clients were known to our care and protection service when they were kids. They'd been abused. And the other thing that was really, really sad for us was that uh, there was almost 100% correlation between that group and going on to benefit. So if you were from one of those households, statistically you would go on to benefit. But if you weren't in the benefit system, you were in the correction system. Those were the two life outcomes, basically, for clients from these type of households. This has forced our cabinet to totally rethink what it is that they provide. And when Minister Bennett spoke to you this morning, some of the radical change that's gone on across the social sector has been driven from the data we were able to generate here. 
And this has forced us to delve into the care and protection space uh, in ways that we'd never done previously uh, and to ask a range of fundamental questions about the role of the state in that space and the relationships across government. And that, I guess, is partly why I want to sort of look at it in terms of the authorising environment because actually when you deal with cross-government, that's tricky and that's tough. One thing to share the data, to do it for research purposes, but in the child protection space you run into the ethical issues, the privacy issues, uh, the health space is very similar, um, and so for us navigating through that has required a authorising environment that's given us a licence to actually do some of those things. All right, I did want to talk about the uh, changing our organisational capacity. We had to build a system to do this, so all of that data is generated through our annual actuarial valuations, and we actually have an in-house actuarial team that does a lot of that for us. And it's really changed two fundamental things for us. One is it's a whole different way of measuring performance. Before, we were driven by KPIs that were related to the number of people that were on benefit. We never asked how long those clients were likely to spend, what their lifetime costs were, and made the trade-off between that and different investments. But the really rich stuff is actually the client segment information, like I demonstrated before. We got screeds of this stuff. We now know more about our clients than we've ever known before. And we've started matching data sets across government to get very rich pictures of our clients. That drives different investment decision making. It drives different uh, de decisions within our service delivery model. We now have whole different streaming rules. What I mean by that is which clients go to which form of case management? How much do we spend on them? How long do they stay there? All of that is driven by that administrative data. We provide different services. We've had to provide different services. Now that we're focusing on sole parents, our primacy, uh, the primacy of childcare, and, and uh, you know, we, we had to put a trial in, space, in place to test what we called flexible childcare. Our childcare market was literally a sort of eight in the morning till six at night. Uh, the labour market for sole parents was 24 hours. So we had to be able to pay childcare 24 hours. Um, we, we had to trial things for groups of clients that we didn't know would work. So we had a range of long-term beneficiaries um, uh, that, uh, that for us we'd never really worked intensely with. We just accepted that they were going to be there. And we've trialled different forms of case management. We've contracted different services out in different ways. We've put our, our entire case management services run as an RCT so that we can measure the impact of it for different client groups. So we've been prepared to test and trial and, and assess the questions. Um, one of the other changes, and this is where the authorising environment is fundamental, was in relation to our establishment of a multi-category appropriation. Our entire funding pot is bundled together into one pot with the decision rights over what we buy sitting with the department. So we can actually shut programs down, start programs, move staff around, all of that without having to go back to ministers. We don't, <laughs> because actually we, we have a trust relationship with ministers, but the legislation allows us to do that. That was a really bold step from ministers to, to give the decision rights to the department. Now we test that um, in conjunction with ministers, so we let them know what we're doing, but having that funding flexibility to be able to actually say, no, that program is not working, take the funding from there and invest it over here, or we're going to prioritise this group and we're going to invest in this way with that group, or we're going to trial this over here, um, without having to keep going back to Cabinet to get decisions about that, um, has been a really big fundamental shift for us. The other thing we needed to do was build an ROI framework, so a return on investment framework, because for all of the funding flexibility we got, we needed to be able to demonstrate the return that we were getting for that. That was the quid pro quo. And linked to that was new accountabilities. We get monitored every quarter by the Treasury. They come in, they look at our performance, they look at where the money's going, and they basically report back to the Minister of Finance in terms of the way we're spending our money. Oh, there it is. All right, so this is from both uh, uh, from Minister Bennett. And this is basically, uh, this was the end of last year, just following the election when she got made the Minister for State Services Commission. And she looked at what we were doing and then she basically said, we could demonstrate the results. I could literally tell the Minister of Finance for every dollar that he gives us of the billion dollars to run the department, what value he gets for every single cent that he gives us. And, and this has changed the way that ministers view uh, both the transparency of the investment that they make, but also the outcomes they expect for that. Um, and so we are now in the space where we're taking advantage of this opportunity to move beyond 
just the work and income space, so the employment dimension with the, uh, with the uh, uh, income support, into the vulnerable children space. Uh, and joining up data across government to really hone in on those groups that are genuinely at risk. Uh, it's not without challenge, uh, but it's a huge opportunity. And if we can get this right uh, and stop that flow into those systems that, uh, that are so costly uh, in adult life, um, this will be huge. So I'll leave it there. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg for us. We, 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 uh, we yeah, are just beginning to explore the possibilities, but it is a whole new way of framing what public value actually can mean and, uh, and the way that we measure outcomes. Thank you.